Trajan, a name that will forever live in Roman history as one of the very best emperors the empire ever had. During his 19-year-long reign, Trajan solidified Rome's position as the undisputed superpower of ancient Europe. By winning two major wars, he also consolidated an administrative system that ensured such a massive empire could function properly, he strengthened the already formidable Roman army, and he ushered an economic boom on the empire's economy by showering it with gold, silver, and slaves from its vanquished enemies. I know it sounds brutal, but these were brutal times. Trajan also left us a lovely numismatic legacy. His coins are quite plentiful, and they tell in exquisite detail the very eventful reign of this man. So, how about we look at some coins struck during Trajan's reign? Let's get started. Before we jump to the coins, let's get to know the man a little bit. Marcus Ulpius Traianus was the first provincial emperor. He was born in 53 AD in the city of Italica, a colony established in 206 BC by Scipio Africanus to settle some of his retired legionaries in what is modern-day southern Spain. The first century AD saw the rise of men of provincial origins to important positions in the imperial administration, titles that were previously held exclusively by Italians. Trajan enlisted in the army when he was a young adult, where he displayed remarkable talent as a commander, leading him to eventually becoming general. He was also very well connected politically, becoming consul before the age of 40, an amazing feat for a provincial. Trajan's family, the Gens Ulpia, were instrumental for the rise of the Flavian dynasty to power, meaning Trajan was always quite close to the upper echelons of imperial power, in particular to Emperor Domitian. Domitian gets a very bad reputation in history books due to his terrible relationship with the Senate and the Roman elite, but he was very well liked by the common people and by the army. Trajan was already one of the most powerful men in Rome years before his ascension to emperor, with vast military experience and entire legions under his command. When Domitian was assassinated and the Senate put one of their own in charge, an old man called Nerva, the army quickly let the new emperor know about their discontent, leading to Nerva adopting Trajan as his successor, placating the army and ensuring political stability. Nerva died within less than two years of becoming emperor, with making way to Trajan in 98 AD. Let's have a look at a denarius from that same year, one of the very first issues of Trajan as an emperor. These early denarii are quite interesting. Trajan looks a lot like Nerva. You see, Trajan did not immediately go to Rome upon his succession. He preferred instead to tour his troops in the Germanic frontier first to ensure their loyalty. So it could be the case that for these very early coins, the engravers back in Rome did not have a bust of Trajan to use as a reference of how he looked like, having instead to merely modify Nervous's old portrait based on accounts of what Trajan was supposed to look like. And since he was adopted by Nerva, Trajan added his name to his own regnal name. So on the legends, we can read Imperator Caesar Nerva Traiano Augustus Germanicus. Notice the epithet Germanicus, celebrating Trajan's victories over the Germanic tribes as he commanded troops up in the Rhine front frontier for many years prior to his accession to emperor. On the reverse, we have a seated figure of Concordia, holding a cornucopia, the horn of abundance, and she sacrificing using a fiery altar. Considering the tensions that were brewing between the military and the previous emperor, I would say the choice for this reverse is perfect. It's perfectly fitted for Trajan's early reign. A message of concord, agreement under between the army, the senate, and the people, with the army, of course, taking the upper hand. On the legends, it reads, Pontifex Maximus, chief priest, tribunicia potestas, with tribunician powers, consul iterum, consul for the second year. Now, here we have a copper ass. With that previous silver denarius, you could get 16 of these coins. This was a much more manageable amount of money, the kind of coin you would use to buy your food and everyday items. Notice the change in portraiture. This time, the portrait is much more similar to what Trajan actually looked like. 
This coin was struck in 101 AD, so of course by this time there was enough time for portraits of the new emperor to be sculpted and shipped to all corners of the empire so mint workers could actually know what the man looked like and sculpt a proper die that looked like Trajan. As for the legends, quite similar to what we had in the previous coin. Imperator Caesar Nervua Traiano, Augustus Germanicus Pontifex Maximus. I really like this reverse. Now we have this great image of the goddess Victory, with her wings outstretched. And she holds by her side a shield, with the initials Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome. The legends show that by the year 101, Trajan had served as consul for two more years. So we see Tribunicia Potestas, with powers of a tribune, Consul Quartum, consul for the fourth year, Pater Patriae, father of the nation. Trajan also had coins struck for many of his family members. His father, also called Marcus Ulpius Traianus, was deified by Trajan, and he had a few different coins, coin types struck in his name. My favorite by far is this wonderful aureus, where on one side we can see the bust of Trajan, while on the other side we see Divus Traianus Pater. It looks like Trajan got his looks from his dad. It was crucial for Trajan to reinforce his family name. After all, despite coming from a traditional Roman family, he was from the provinces, so it was important to show that he was of, let's say, pure Roman stock, despite being born in the less noble provinces, in order to get legitimacy, of course, with the Roman elites. Coins celebrating his wife, Plotina, his sister, Marciana, and his daughter, Matidia, were also made, Plotina in particular was quite influential in Rome's intellectual circles, and she was instrumental for the ascension of the following emperor, Hadrian, who was himself the son of Trajan's cousin. Plotina seemed to really love Hadrian, raising him like a son. Later on, later on Trajan's reign, she influenced her husband on picking Hadrian as his successor. I can't help but notice that despite marble busts of this three women existing, the die engravers for these coins seem to have made their portraits in the likeness of Trajan. <laughs> I mean, it's not like I want to disrespect such gorgeous coins and influential women, but look at these coins. I just see Trajan wearing a wig on all three portraits. In any case, the first priority for Trajan was dealing with the Dacian threat. Between 86 and 88 AD, during Domitian's reign, an inconclusive war between Rome and Dacia was fought, with the Dacians managing very beneficial terms. Trajan could not accept such a powerful state being so close to Rome's sphere of influence, so he went to war to squash this threat once and for all. By 106 AD, Sarmizegetusa, the Dacian capital, was captured, with Trajan annexing a part of Dacia as a new province, very rich in gold mines. The spoils of this war, in slaves and precious metals, helped Trajan build some of Rome's most iconic structures, with many of them still standing to this day, such as Trajan's market and his famous column, which tells the story of the campaign. Let's have a look at a couple of denarii from that time. Here is a denarius struck in 106, the year the Romans finally broke the Dacians. Notice Trajan's heroic naked bust in this coin, styling him as a hero. On the legends, there's a new title to Trajan's regnal name. Imperator Caesar Nerua Traiano Augustus Germanicus Dacicus, see, Dacicus, conqueror of the Dacians, Pontifex Maximus Tribunicia Potestas. On the reverse, we have an image of Equitas, the goddess of equity, fair trade and rule of law. After such an important victory against the Dacians, the Senate gave Trajan the title Optimo Princeps, something like the best ruler, the best emperor. And here we can read this new honorary title. The legends start with Consul for the fifth year, Pater Patriae, father of the nation, and then Optimo Principi Senatus Populusque Romanus, the best ruler of the Senate and the people of Rome. The later we go into Trajan's reign, the longer the legends on his coins get. I think no emperor was quite like Trajan in advertising every single honorary title he had. Here's another interesting example. This is a later one. It's from 116 AD, so very late in his reign. Here we have a change in proportions. 
Trajan's head looks a bit smaller if compared to the previous coin, and he is shown wearing a paludamentum, a cloak emperors would wear over their armor. As for the legends, it's quite a mouthful once again. Imperator Caesar Nerva Traiano Optimo Augustus Germanicus Dacicus. I really like the reverse of this coin. We have Mars, the god of war, very fitting for such a successful general like Trajan. He's completely naked, except for a helmet over his head, he's carrying a spear in one hand and a trophy over his shoulder. This piece was made when Trajan was in the Middle East, fighting on another important war we'll discuss shortly. So we could interpret this coin as Trajan, Trajan being incarnate as Mars himself, going to war once more. The legends continue on with his imperial titles. Pontifex Maximus, Tribunicia Potestas, Consul for the Sixth Year, Pater Patriae Senatus Populusque Romanos. A part of the spoils of war brought from Dacia was spent in a series of grandiose projects in Rome, a lot of them celebrated on coins. On your screen now we have an example of a Cistercius with Trajan's new port located in the city of Ostia, Rome's main harbor city, where all of the products from all corners of the empire were unloaded before being sent to the capital itself. Ostia's main harbor by that time was built by Emperor Claudius, but Trajan's new port greatly increased its capacity. The Circus Maximus, which up to that time was a wooden structure, was completely renovated, this time as a stone structure, with cistercies such as this one giving an interesting glimpse on how it must have looked like, since not a lot of it is left today. Trajan also built an impressive forum right in the middle of the capital, and a column entirely covered in carvings which told the story of his Dacian campaign. The column still stands to this day, and you can visit it in Rome. Sadly for the forum, only the base of the structure can still be seen, but if you ever have a chance to go to Rome, it's pretty easy to see it used to be a massive structure and a major landmark in the center of the city. Now, let's quickly go over Trajan's lesser-known conquest, the capture of the Nabataean kingdom. The Nabataeans were a settled Bedouin people that ruled an area around modern-day Jordan and part of the Arabian Peninsula during the Hellenistic period. The Nabataeans themselves aren't that famous, but their capital, the city of Petra, an entire city carved in the rocks of the desert, is one of the most spectacular archaeological sites you could ever visit. By the time of Trajan, they were nothing but a vassal of Rome. They could barely call themselves independent. But when their last king, Rabel II, died, Rome simply marched in and reduced the kingdom to yet another Roman province, in a bloodless conquest, changing the region's name to Arabia Petrea. The Nabataeans operated a series of local trade networks, and even had their own monetary standard. Their main silver coin was called a Sela. It weighed around 3.5 grams, so it was around the same weight of a silver drachma struck by the, Lo the Romans in the neighboring regions. So when Trajan took over this kingdom, many of these Nabataean Sela were withdrawn and restruck into Roman drachma. Let's have a look at one of such examples. Here we have a drachma struck over a Sela of Rabel II. The Romans did not pick Petra as the capital of their new province, picking instead a larger city called Bostra, further up north, on what is today southern Syria. Most of these coins are dated around 106 to 110 AD. Before going over the design elements of this coin, notice at the top, slightly to the right, on the 1, 2 o'clock position, how we can still see some of the Aramaic letters from the original Sela coin this piece was struck over. Coins like this serve as proof that the Romans used old silver coins instead of striking brand new pieces. The style of the portrait also looks quite different to what one could find in an imperial coin, showing that the dye for this coin was also fruit of local dye engravers. The legends are in Greek, as the language that would be spoken in the region, and they read Autokratoros, Kaisaros, Nerua Trajanos Sebastos, Germanico Dacico. Basically, a direct translation to what we saw on previous denarii, but of course they were in Latin. 
Looking at the reverse, we have an image of the incarnation of Arabia. We have a veiled female figure. She holds a rolled map of the province on her left hand, and on her outstretched right hand, she holds a bundle of cinnamon sticks, a common spice traded in the area. On her back, we have a charming little camel, a very common sight on the deserts of the region. The legends once more state Trajan's imperial titles, but this time in Greek. Demarchos, Exousias, Upatos, Epsilon, meaning, with tribunitian powers, consul for the fifth time. Now, let's go to Trajan's last major war, and in my opinion, his most impressive victory against the Parthian Empire. By Trajan's time, the Parthians were this massive Iranian empire located in the Middle East. And since Republican times, they represented a big threat to Rome, beating the Roman armies in multiple occasions. Conflict began around 114 AD, when the Parthians invaded Armenia, a buffer state between Rome and Parthia, and established a Parthian sympathizer on its throne. Trajan saw this as a completely valid justification for total war. Between 115 and 117, Trajan invaded and managed to beat the Parthians, invading Mesopotamia and extending the Roman frontier to its largest extension ever. Sadly for the Romans, holding this territory would prove to be extremely difficult due to the locals engaging in guerrilla warfare. Hadrian, his successor, would later abandon Mesopotamia, claiming it to be indefensible, bringing the Roman frontier to what it was before Trajan's war. Trajan would certainly roll in his grave for such transgression, but Hadrian's choice was, I would say, in my personal opinion, quite sensible. It's hard to defend this region. It's, it's not called the cemetery of empires for nothing. Having beaten the Parthians, of course, Trajan would have to add another title to his very long regno name. Here we have a piece that was most likely issued to pay for the war expenses, a silver tetadrachma from Antioch the third largest city of the empire and base of operations for all eastern campaigns. The fact these are such common coins nowadays clearly shows the scope of the invasion must have been massive. So in any case, this big coin of nearly 14 grams is from the year 116 AD. On the obverse, we have the laureate bust of Trajan, with the legends Autocratoros, Caesaros, Nerva, Traianos, Sebastos, and then his three conquests, Germanicos, Dacicos, Particos, conquer of the Germans, the Dacians, and the Parthians. On the reverse, we have an eagle, the animal that symbolized Jupiter, the king of the Roman pantheon of gods. Under him, we have the dismembered leg of an antelope, and the legends continue with Trajan's obverse legends, with more of his titles, which once more translates to with tribunitian powers for the 16th year, consul for the sixth year. The number of these coins struck during Trajan's campaign was so vast that the region was well supplied with coins for generations. Trajan's successor, Hadrian, struck just a few tetadrachma in his early reign, and Antoninus Pius, the following emperor, didn't strike any silver in Antioch at all during his over two decades of reign. Trajan was already 63 years old when he concluded his Parthian campaign, and his health was failing him. As he was returning to Rome, out of a sudden his health quickly deteriorated, and he died in the city of Selinus, on modern-day southern Turkey. There was some controversy in regards to his succession. Trajan did not publicly name Hadrian as his heir, with his wife, Plotina, remember, the one that really liked Hadrian, presenting a letter, supposedly written by Trajan himself on his deathbed, that designated Hadrian as the next emperor, by announcing his adoption by Trajan. Despite the questionable circumstances around Trajan's death, Hadrian was so well connected to the late emperor's family and the upper ranks of the military that he assumed the imperial throne without any issues. There is a very rare gold aureus that shows Hadrian and Trajan together, with Hadrian depicted as Adriano, Traiano Caesari, to Hadrian, Trajan's Caesar. I love how ambiguous this coin is. 
The legends on Trajan's side still name him as the ruling emperor. If this coin was made during Trajan's reign, it clearly designates Hadrian as his heir, putting to rest any claims that Hadrian's adoption was faked by Plotina. On the other hand, this coin could have been made as an attempt on Hadrian's part to give him legitimacy. Hadrian's early coins as emperor also rely heavily on Trajan's prestige. This other example of an aureus shows Hadrian and the now deified Trajan together. Looking at the legends of this coin in more detail, on the obverse, Hadrian will not only add Trajan's name to his own, his name here reads Imperator Caesar Traiano Hadriano, but he also names all of Trajan's conquests and honorary titles. Optimo Augusto Germanicus Dacicus Partico. As for the reverse, it shows the bust of Trajan wearing the paludamentum over his cuirass, and the legends Divo Traiano Patri Augusto, meaning something like to the father of the emperor, the deified Trajan, once more reinforcing the fact Hadrian was adopted by Trajan. As we can see, Hadrian used every single opportunity he had to connect himself to Trajan, and I mean, it made sense. Trajan was considered the very best emperor Rome ever had since the days of Augustus. And for the last coin of today, a coin celebrating Trajan struck over a century after his death. Issuing coins celebrating previous emperors was nothing new to the Romans. The Julio-Claudians did it, the Flavians as well, all the way back in the 1st century AD. But here we have a coin from the 3rd century. This was a very rough century for the Romans. Lots of civil wars, barbarian invasions, and the long list of emperors with very short reigns and horrible violent deaths. The guy who struck this coin, known to us as Decius, was no exception. He reigned just for two years, between 249 and 251 AD. In an attempt to boost morale, he issued a series of coins celebrating previous emperors. Maybe he wanted to show the Romans living in these difficult times that they inherited Rome from these great men. He issued coins in the name of Augustus, Vespasian, Marcus Aurelius, the names you would typically expect. He even issued coins for Commodus, showing he was rather popular with the average Roman. Of course, Trajan was on this list of good emperors to be depicted on coins, so here's a piece struck 134 years after Trajan's death, a testimony to how well loved he was by the Romans. On the obverse, we have the bust of the emperor, now wearing the radiate crown instead of the laureate crown typically seen in his denarii, and the legends are very straightforward. Divo Traiano, the divine Trajan. On the reverse, we have an altar used to make offerings to the gods. On top of it, we have a flame. In a typical Roman religious ceremony, certain offering, offerings were burned. The flame would burn the offering, making its ashes fly up towards the heavens, where the gods would receive the offering. Around the design, the legends, consecratio, consecrated, of course, making a reference to Trajan's divine status. Trajan is up amongst the very best emperors of Rome. The empire saw its largest territorial extension under him, and some argue after him, things started going downhill, as he marked the absolute apex of Roman supremacy. Do you have a coin struck under Trajan? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode, leave a like and consider subscribing if you did, Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon!